to you a little bit about what we do and tell you a little bit about some of the trends that we think are really important and interesting uh, shaping the future of financial services as it is today. Um, after that, Alec has the uh, opportunity really to interview uh, Sohail, and I, I will let all of them kind of take it from here. Alec, are you, right I'm so sorry, here you go. No, definitely, uh, thank you everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all here tonight uh, you know, to discuss the future of financial services as, as we conceive it, but I think much more the trends and fundamental disruptions and transformations that are happening across society and culture that are impacting financial services. And so, as Keisha mentioned, we have an amazing group of panelists and speakers here tonight. I am by far the least interesting person that you're going to hear from, but I'm going to set a little bit of context as to why we're all here, what it is that, that we do, um, and then we're going to dive into our first interview. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, what is this place in who is GSV Labs. Uh, we're an innovation platform based here in Silicon Valley in Boston. We work with all of the stakeholders of the innovation economy, startups, corporations, governments, nonprofits, investors, everything in between, because we think magical things happen when you bring all of those stakeholders inside one physical community, but increasingly inside one virtual community, and network effects really take off there. We have about 200 physical startups in our innovation centers between here and in Boston. We have 8,000 startups on our online platform, about 50 join every day. So increasingly, all of the resources and value that we provide is available online, on demand, from any device. And that's what gets us really excited about the future. And our goal is to bring together all the resources that an early stage company needs to really do amazing things. Um, as I mentioned, you don't have to be in one of our innovation centers to get value out of this. We have GSV Passport, which puts our community, our mentor network, our investors, a million dollars in technology services and, and technology platforms, all of our learning content and best practices content, all online. And it's not just for startups, universities, nonprofits, governments are private labeling the platform to manage their own startup ecosystem. And super excited to announce that we're now in early release of both the B2B platform for universities like University of Pennsylvania, Tech Day Monterey, uh, University College London as of yesterday, and we're powering their ecosystems. And then as of now, we're also developing a new version of the platform for large global enterprises that want to stand up, manage, and grow their internal innovation ecosystem system. So in the end of the day, what we're really moving towards is powering the innovation communities of universities, corporations, startups, and everything in between. So that's GSV Labs. You've heard more than enough about that. Uh, what we're really excited today is to talk about is kind of the dynamic and landscape of financial services and what's so different and magical about today when it comes to this future of financial services. And so when we say financial services, uh, we basically mean everything. Um, financial services are wrapped into almost every element of commerce, the economy, every good and service. And we're talking about things like banking and lending, investments and wealth management, you know, insurance, payments. And when you put all of these things together, it's expected to be a $26.5 trillion industry by 2022. And, but it's an industry that's going through massive transformations and, and kind of shifts in value. And so we'll take two or three minutes and talk through some of those gravitational shifts that we think are redefining the future of financial services. The first of those gravitational shifts is what we call the experience economy. And so if you look at how value has been delivered historically over time, it started with commodities, it evolved into manufactured and made goods, then we had what we called the service economy, and then now we're in this new kind of landscape where it's actually experiences and the ability to deliver delightful customer experiences that generate the most value for companies. And so when we say an experience, what we mean is this memorable event around you know, a consumer service or consumer experience that's actually developed into a distinct economic offering. And you know, this isn't a new concept. There are brands that we love and we trust that have you know, built amazing experiences around them, like Apple and Disney and Starbucks and Nike, that were more than just the service or the good they provided, but this ethos um, which consumers interacted with. And what we're seeing now is that that dynamic is coming to financial services, and it's coming to a bank near you, where you know, more than a transaction or more than a payment, it's actually how do you take this burdensome you know, process of financial services and actually make it delightful. 
The second major shift, and this is one that's driving that first shift towards experience, is what we call digital natives rule. Um, we are obsessed with the class of 2020. These are people who are graduating university next year. I know we've got a great group from the University of Toronto here tonight. Woot, woot, shout out. Um, and the class of 2020 is, you know, so interesting. I, I know every generation says that the generation after them is so fundamentally different and, you know, unlike them. But when it comes to the class of 2020, there's actually some real truth to it. Because 21 years ago, a, a couple magical things happened. Um, you know, first and foremost, Google was born. And so most of the class of 2020 grew up with information being ubiquitous, free, on demand. Today we have four trillion Google searches a day. And so the class of 2020 expects you know, seamless information on demand the way they want it. 21 years ago, Steve Jobs went back to Apple and the personal computer became a reality. So most of the class of 2020 grew up with a computer in their home, in their library, in their school, and there's an expectation that technology is intuitive, ubiquitous, um, and invaluable to people. The smartphone is a phone. Uh, mo most of the class of 2020 cannot imagine not having endless computing power sitting in their pocket, and as a result of that, expectations around every mode of commerce have changed. Everything's on demand and personalized, from transportation, to commerce, to delivery of food, even media is now being delivered in completely different models based upon these changing consumer demands. And the reality is it's coming to financial services. As this new group of consumers comes in, becomes you know, the, the, working, the workforce and the, the main earners in the economy, there are major new expectations they have around what financial services mean to them. There's a huge trust and confidence in technology. On the flip side, there's a massive lack of trust in traditional financial institutions because most of the class of 2020 grew up during the foreclosure and financial crisis of the 2000s and they grew up with their friends, their families, losing their homes, lo losing pensions. So it's no surprise that millennial home ownership is down about 10% just from 2007. Millennials, they don't only wanna not own cars, they don't even, or sorry, homes, they don't even wanna own cars. Last year was the first year that more cars were sold to people over 75 than between 18 and 24. And what this is really reflecting is a, a shift in how this class of 2020, this digital native group, values assets. And as a result of that, financial services firms are having to change how they interact, developing things like on-demand insurance, flexible wealth management that really fit the needs and expectations of this emerging you know, digital native group. The third shift is what we call banking unbundled. And I, if you're, you know, spend time in financial services, this won't be a particularly new concept to you. Um, if you look at the 15 largest banks in the US, they have about $13 trillion in assets. And all you have to do is go to any one of their home pages to see that they basically do everything. Lending, insurance, uh, you know, business banking, all of the financial institutions of today have become these massive kind of cross-functional platforms. And every single one of those functions is being attacked at the margins by hundreds or thousands of emerging startups. So we see every single thing that Wells Fargo used to do is now being done by this massive portfolio of emerging fintech companies. And that's being fueled by an incredible amount of capital that's going into the space. So if you look from 2011 to 2018, a huge growth in venture capital going into the fintech space, about 40 billion last year, which actually represents 20x growth from just 2011. So we're living in this phenomena of more and more capital going towards unbundling these kind of legacy banking systems. But it's not just startups. Um, the biggest tech companies in the world are diving into financial services with things like the Apple Card, which gave out $10 billion in credit in less than 30 days. Things like Amazon Pay that now have over 300 million users. And so Amazon is going and trying to disrupt every business payment structure that you know, exists out there today. And it's not just in the US. If you go to Alibaba and Tencent in China, um, they actually have about 90% market share when it comes to mobile payments. And they're actually starting to look like financial services firms. The average Ant Financial user has over three financial services that they're doing with the firm, which is starting to look more like a legacy bank rather than a technology company. But again, it's not even just the technology companies. Those experience economy trusted brands that we love so much are moving into financial services. Um, 
it, you may, may blow your mind, but the Starbucks payment app has 25.2 million users. Until two weeks ago, it was the single most used payment application in the United States, ahead of Apple Pay. It was literally two weeks ago that Apple Pay actually surpassed Starbucks as having more payment use than a single retailer. And Starbucks still has more than twice as many users as Google Pay or Samsung Pay. So all of these brands that we love and trust are starting to move down into financial services. The fourth gravitational shift is what we call automation and, and democratization. And this likely won't come as a surprise to anyone. Uh, we are now, you know, the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law, and, you know, this was the, the presupposition that uh, computing power would increase exponentially, and, you know, 50 years later, what we've seen is that, you know, it's largely been true, and, and that's had some pretty dramatic impacts across just about every industry and every culture. The cost of computing has declined about 99% since 2000. Cost of storage has taken a, a very similar route. So, Compute storage today are basically free, ubiquitous, endless. We like to kind of tell a joke that if hard assets and hard goods decreased in the same rate, a car that cost $20,000 in 1990 would cost a dollar today, and we'd probably throw it away after every single use. And that's the real power of digital infrastructure and digital economics. So today we have 3.7 billion people with internet access, 2.6 billion smartphones, hundreds of billions of app downloads, and these are digital infrastructure that's allowing new ideas, new applications to go from the back of a napkin to millions of users almost overnight. And it's what's allowing things like $7 trillion to be managed by robo-financial advisors by 2025. And so this automation is kind of affecting every layer of both financial services, but even beyond financial services. And what we're seeing is a fundamental change in how financial services are delivered as a result of automation. Historically, it was kind of a great pyramid. Um, the best financial services were reserved for the people at the very top. And you had to have a certain you know, net worth or income to really access high quality financial services. What we're now living in as a result of automation and digital disruption is a world of financial services for all, where you get financial services and you get financial services and you get financial services because we're able to deliver them at a cost and you know, it, with an infrastructure value that we just couldn't do historically. But so all that I just talked for 10 minutes very quickly about you know, all of the interesting innovation and kind of disruption that's happening. But we need a little bit of a reality check. Um, and there are some folks in the audience here who come from large financial institutions. And as I've been saying all of this, the reality check's probably been going off in the back of their head, which is despite all of this innovation and change, um, the world is actually moving very slowly. And financial services is actually changing relatively slowly. So we love talking about how disruptive startups are. But in the end of the day, uh, advantage goes to the incumbents. So just for a little bit of context, go to the largest robo-advisor in the world, Wealthfront. They're managing about $21 billion in assets. Compare that to the largest traditional wealth manager at $1.7 trillion. Right? So just the smallest fraction of a fraction of market share in this space. Go to the largest online bank, Ally, about $106 billion. Then go to JP Morgan Chase. So these, in, you know, these emerging technology companies are doing amazing things, but they're doing it in an environment that's incredibly biased against them because of the, the power that these incumbent financial institutions have. And so you know, you're seeing financial institutions take advantage of these new technologies and methodologies. People like Goldman Sachs launching Marcus, their new robo-advisory and, you know, bottom of the pyramid solution. So these are opportunities both for the new emerging companies as well as for the incumbents. So it leads to like a very reasonable question of what's next. We have breakthrough disruption happening on the ground. We have trillion dollar financial institutions on the other side. And the first wave was these, you know, these disruptive companies coming and trying to disrupt or break the legacy financial institutions. Um, I personally think that wave is slowing down, and we're seeing a new wave, which is, did we just become best friends? And an opportunity to take the talent, the speed, and the agility of early stage emerging technology companies, 
combine them with the distribution, the assets, the brand of these legacy institutions to really create an environment of partnership and experimentation. So what we're particularly excited about is not the disruptive technology companies, it's not the legacy financial institutions that are driving innovation, it's the folks that are creating that ecosystem and bringing those together because that's where we really think breakthrough innovation will happen and we'll see all these institutions start to form new habits for a new way of working. So what's the future? The future is rapidly expanding technology across various horizontals, AI, IoT, blockchain, you know, the list of technology buzzwords goes on and on and on. On the other side of the equation, you have rapidly changing consumer demands, new digital natives that have completely different expectations of what financial services are going to be. And what's going to bring those two together is breakthrough innovation in financial services and fintech. And that's what we're hoping to discuss today. You don't have to listen to me anymore. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And we'll dive right into the content in one moment. Thank you so much. So with that, um, I will speak far less. And it's my pleasure to welcome Suhail Aslam from PayActive to the stage. Wouldn't be the valley without some technical difficulties. Uh, well, perfect. I, you know, and I will save you having to listen through an introduction uh, of yourself from me. I'd, I'd love you to just tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and about PayActive and, and how you got here. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, my name is Sohail. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and chief technology officer at PayActive. We are based in San Jose, California. I think it was 2011, 2012. Uh, when uh, we thought about this idea, I mean, we, we are living in Silicon Valley and there are so many solution chasing problems. We were fortunate enough that we detected a problem that was a genuine problem. And the problem was nothing but uh, people living paycheck to paycheck. So we realized more than 90 million people, they were, um, they were living paycheck to paycheck. They didn't even have $400 in savings. And they were becoming victim to these services such as payday loan shops, pawn shops, so we thought this was a problem we detected, and this was not a good problem, but a bad problem. So it really needed a solution. Uh, we, we had backgrounds, myself and the team, we had background in uh, payments and in financial services. So, so we thought about digging further into the problem. It turned out that people who were going to the payday loan shops and pawn shops, uh, you know, or um, they were becoming victim of overdraft fees, they were basically were able to get this money uh, because of their payroll, payroll that was locked. So when somebody was going to the payday loan shops, basically they were asking a loan and the lender was giving them money with the hope that this person was working and was going to get money on a certain date. So they were giving them, let's say, $200 and they were charging them about $30, $40, $50, dollars, whatever was possible at that time. So we thought this is bad for the, for the people and there is a disruption that was waiting for us. And that's how we came up with the solution of PayActive, where we enable people to access their own income whenever they want. So in, in reality, we made payroll real time. So you know, in, in general, payroll is like a batch process. right? You work for a pay period, two weeks, one week, or a, or a month, and your employer pushes money to you. We tried to enable people so that they could pull their money. So it was a push versus pull. It was a technical thing, right? Push versus pull. So we enabled people to be able to pull their money. And that was the solution. Uh, super helpful. And talk to me a little bit about the business model and how you get into the payroll cycle through the employer. You know, what does a deployment of PayActive look like? Sure. So we were trying to you know, go after payday loan shops. So we didn't want to become a payday loan, right? Uh, so what could we do was that we thought, what what could we do to eliminate all those hurdles which were there so that our cost was minimum? So when we found that there were ways that we could access the income data, like you know the earned hours, the hourly rate, and so on, those data elements we were looking for, we were able to find those ways to get the data. So we realized we needed to have census data and employees' basic uh, information, like employee ID, first name, last name, and so on. And we also were looking for hourly data. Most of the hourly employees were victim of this 
payday loan business. So we, we realized that there was a way that uh, time and attendance systems could spit out information and we could capture that information through secured methods such as SFTP or back, back then like seven years ago, we even leveraged on SharePoint and you know, even email. So we were able to access the data, we did basic maths and we found, concluded the gross income and then we found that you know, we could afford to give 50% of the income. First we thought maybe employers would let us take their money and give it to the employees. It turned out that employers were not interested. So They like to float. There you go, exactly, exactly. So then, then we thought, okay, uh, we'll make sure that we arrange the money, and we did arrange the money. So we started giving money to people. So today, the way it works is we get those two data feeds, census data and time and attendance data, and then when the pay period ends, all the money that people have accessed, we submit a deduction. It could be leveraging on those channels or APIs which payroll companies have, or we can just send the old-fashioned files that banking system is based on. So we send the deduction file, employer processes the deduction, and as a result, they return our money back to us. So this whole cycle completes as the payday comes. Now, it, it sounds like an immense amount of technical infrastructure and complexity that kind of gets you there. You know, I, I think most of us have seen a lot of different platforms that are going after this space of, you know, delay in payments and, and how do we smooth out, you know, for the workforce. How do you think about differentiating pay active kind of from the rest of that ecosystem? Sure. So it's maybe a bit funny that uh, our technology, pay active technology, is egoless technology. There's no ego in the technology. I mean, when we started, we thought that, you know, we should have the solution for people that they could access their own income. Uh, how could they access? Well, the classic method was that have a mobile app or a desktop version that we could have for people. But then we also realized that there were some people they wanted to have their own flavor around that. So we, um, we, we crafted our architecture in such a way that people could embrace us, people could encapsulate pay active technology. So today what you see in the mobile app, we have partners who have taken our app and have embedded inside their own app. So that is, that is something we call as embedded mode. So people can embed inside it. A uh, few of our partners that we have one of the scheduling company. So they have embedded us inside their app. So people basically log in their, in their mobile app just because they want to see that how much is accessible I have. You know, keep in mind, maybe it's a separate thing from the to core topic or core question, but keep in mind that people, when they see that number, how much money is accessible to them, that gives them peace of mind. In the, in the beginning, when we rolled it out, people were logging into our mobile app and they were not doing anything. So we were questioning that, you know, is there any problem in our, in our app or in our system? Uh, there was no problem. So we called a few people, then we tried to detect the behavior and we realized that people, just like many other people who log into their bank accounts, maybe at least once a week or multiple times in a week, just to see, oh, my, my money is available? Okay, fine, just log out and come out. Same behavior we could detect. So in our technology, we not only enable our partners to embed our solution inside their technology, but also we unleashed our API. It's a RESTful API, so people can embed us, people can integrate with us. And that's how in different flavors, so there is no uh, you know, branding consciousness that we have. You can interact, you can deploy our technology by having inside, on your, inside your own technology or just take, a, take this technology as is. And just to provide some context to everyone, uh, how many employees can currently act, access PayActive? What, what's the scale of, of the company and the technology right now? So we have thousands of employers right now who have embraced. Um, I would like to tell you that the largest employer in the world is, uh, private employer, is Walmart. And Walmart utilizes PayActive. We have several others who are basically using. And then as we are growing, many larger employers, they are uh, embracing PayActive. And, and so you've gotten a really interesting spot in the market right now, which is this, you know, employee-centric, you know, wellness and, and, and payment opportunity. Where do you want PayActive to be five years from now or ten years from now? And what's the big picture vision for the company beyond, you know, that element? Sure. Uh, for PayActive, you know, when we started um, in 2012 and 2013 when our, we went live with first customer, we enable people to access their own income. But we didn't stop there. 
we didn't stop there because we thought there was a huge room to have a greater impact. So as a result, we started adding more services. The initial solution was that you could take the money, you could um, take money uh, you know, by utilizing an ATM or by using your bank account. But we also added more services, such as you could load funds on PayPal, you could load funds on Amazon. Why Amazon? Because today, if you don't have a credit card or an instrument, you cannot make any purchases. We did partnership with, uh, with Amazon. You could load funds on Amazon, and you can make the purchases. The best of all, one of the best integrations that we have, or uh, the, the partnership that we have, is with Uber. So today, you use your income, earn income. You don't have a credit card, no problem. You just have PayActive app. You can buy rides. Three weeks ago, I was looking at our data, and I realized there is somebody in North Carolina. She utilized um, PayActive uh, Uber integration 23 times. We maximum allow $500, 50% of income that people can access up to $500. She utilized $483 and got 23 rides. You know why? Car was, car was not there, broke down. So living paycheck to paycheck, you don't have money, your car is not functional, you cannot go to your workplace. You are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a hole that you cannot come out. However, with PayActive, the money that she, has, she had already earned, she could leverage on that money and she could buy all those rights. So all these services that we have been adding, that's where we see that you know, we, uh, we are different. And we recently got our first patent. And the patent is about we have elevated earn wage access at a level where you see it competing with different instruments. So today, if you have to pay a bill or you have to make a purchase, you would use your credit card or a bank account or maybe cash. Well, today, you, if you have PayActive um, app and you have earned income, you directly use that. So in other words, we have removed all those instruments in between your payment or your usage. You just directly pull your funds right from your uh, earned wage access pool and utilize it. And that's the innovation, and that's where we are, we are today, and we will keep adding more and more services which are applicable to, to millions of people. And you know, as, as you look at the move that PayActive is making inside of payments, it, it mirrors a much broader transition in that's happening with kind of redefined work roles. And, and that's something that we discussed when we talked a couple days ago, which is with the rise of the gig economy and the freelancer economy, you're seeing these expectations start to get kind of baked into some of these businesses. How do you see those new business models affecting both maybe the opportunity and future of PayActive? Yeah, so I think gig economy is validating what we had envisioned seven, eight years ago. Today, um, one of the fear uh, traditional employers have is that they are losing their employees uh, because of gig economy. And the use case is as follows. If I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I, life happens, I don't have money, my employer would be paying, paying me when the payday comes, well, guess what, that morning, I would prefer to work for Uber or Lyft. Why? Because at the end of the day, I'll be able to access my income. So gig economy is really helping us because we are enabling traditional employers to offer the same service. Why lose employees to Uber and Lyft or other gig economy players? You can keep your employees. You can you know, beef up your uh, retention. And as a result, employees would stay there. Why? Because they will be able to uh, access their own income. It's all about empowerment. It's all about, I would say, control. If I feel that I have control of my own income, it's not a loan or advance, I would settle there. I would be more engaged. I'll be focusing more. Uh, so we thank gig economy that they have highlighted it. No, that, that's fair. I don't know a lot of people thanking the gig economy right now, but it's, it's <laughs> always great to find one. Uh, you know, I, you made a kind of interesting point there, which is, you know, PayAct has been around for, you know, a little while. I think it was founded back in 2012. Yep. Um, what are some of the, you know, I was talking about kind of magic of technology and infrastructure. What are some of the things that you can do today that 10 or 15 years ago or just were impossible that now make pay active real? Sure. I think this concept of uh, app store or marketplace, to probably it's a better word, this concept that everybody's coming up with, uh, with the marketplace is, is unique. Uh, Ever since it emerged, uh, people thought that there should be a way to, uh, to share the data. 
So the emergence of APIs, you know, today you see the from SOAP to RESTful APIs that we have. Uh, why? Because we want to make sure that the that data is shared easily. So maybe 10, 15 years ago, the ecosystems of API was not that stronger. Today we have partnership with many different payroll companies, time and attendance companies, like the larger ones, ADP, uh, Kronos, Paychex, um, other service providers that we have, uh, you know, the Amazons of the world and Ubers of the world. They have APIs. These APIs were not existing before, like 15 years ago or so. So now because we have that, we can integrate with them. Not only that, but we, are, we have also exposed our API by understanding the, the importance of that. As a result, we have partners who have integrated with us. So this, this interaction, this focus on sharing data is helping us a lot. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's a beautiful segue into the negative or the dark side of sharing data, which is I don't think we can have a conversation around financial services innovation without discussing data and cybersecurity and privacy. You know, with you having millions of employees whose financial information is flowing through your system, how do you convince the Walmarts of the world uh, that, that this is the right place for financial data to be flowing? Absolutely. So, you know, security, as we know, security is not a linear thing. It's, it's a layered thing. So we at PayActive, we have made sure that we, we uh, have multiple layers so that even if somebody crosses one layer, the second layer is there as a hindrance. That, that, that is one thing. So all the bells and whistles that are needed, we have put in place. We have acquired those certifications just to validate, not to have certifications for the sake of certification, such as ISO 27001 or you know these casual, usual SOC 1, SOC 2 reports, to validate that. We have done partnership with, uh, with different other companies, like for example, Qualys and uh, Palladian, these different companies that we utilize. So they scan us. They, they validate that you know, it's, it's not possible to get into our, uh, our network or into our solution. But one thing we know, that no, it's not easy anymore to, um, to penetrate into anybody's network. Most of the time when the problem happens, problem happens from inside. Some insider takes the data and just puts somewhere, maybe on the dark web or you know, any, anywhere. So that's where the control comes. In our product, in our solution, because you know, what you see is a mobile app, but then there is a huge backend. So we have defined those tiers. We have defined those roles and then the privileges. As a result, what you need, only you have access to that. So that, that, that is about the access side. But when it comes to storing the data, there is a fundamental thing. When you get the data, if you're really a data geek, you would love to have anything that is coming your way. However, there is a cost to that. So at PayActive, when we store any information at, in, in our data repositories, we are very careful. We do debate that should we store this data or should we not store this data? Is it possible that we could have partners where we store the data and have a reference to that data? Card is one example. We wouldn't store full card number, but we could store a reference. I mean, if that is the, the nature of business, if I'm li like a merchant, why should I store the card information? I should just store a reference, and the card should be with the processor. Card should be with the, with the institute who is issuing. So I, with the reference, I could execute the complete transaction. So it's multiple things that you have to do, and that's what we do to make sure that you know, our data is secured. So it's a big, scary world out there. I'm glad I'm not having to run security for you all. Um, you know, my favorite question to ask, and this will be the last question, then we'll throw it over to the audience. If folks have any questions, want to make sure you have a chance to, to get the voice on the stage. Uh, but what's one topic or trend or opportunity inside this landscape of financial wellness that you're really excited about but no one's really talking about today or there's not a huge focus on, but you think a year from now or two years from now, we'll be up on stage you know, diving into that topic. What, what's out there for you? Sure, um, I think it, it, was, it was a similar topic that I was covering um, a few weeks ago at HR Tech Conference and uh, the, the, the topic was people-centric HR. So what is people-centric HR? People-centric HR is where you think uh, by putting your feet in their shoes. Gone are the days that I could judge my employees that you know if they are broken or they don't have enough funds or they are living paycheck to paycheck, that's their problem. Um, that's not the state we are living in today. We have to beef up our 
offerings when it comes to benefits. We have to think in terms of their problems. We have to see how we can solve the problems. And that's what PayActive has done. PayActive today, um, you know, the flagship service certainly is access, access to earned wage, you know, wages. However, today you can make purchases by these partnerships that we have. We have provided financial counseling. We have provided financial literacy. Saving and budgeting tools are there as well. So there is an assortment of services that we have provided. Go back to the question, employers have to pay more. They have to play a bigger role here. You have to participate in all those initiatives, initiatives because the thing is, if your employee is financially stressed, can you imagine that the person, you know, give 100% of her work or her time or her mind? Impossible. So if we want to get 100% of our employees, we have to make sure that we help them to reduce the financial stress. And with all these different services, we can help them. There's no guarantee that we can reduce all the financial stress, but at least we can make an attempt. And the, the, these are proven attempts that we have made, and we believe this in next one, two, three years, employers are going to embrace this program. Employers are going to have those services which remove or reduce financial stress. Well, at least the employers that want to retain their workforce will. Um, and I, I look forward to next November having you back here to talk about financial wellness as a benefit and, you know, the, um, the emergence of, of that trend. Um, you know, with that, I, I want to thank Suhail for dealing with my questions and would love to turn it over to the audience. I think we have a couple folks probably um, that have microphones in the back. Kate there. So if you have a question, raise your hand and she will bring you a mic uh, and we'd love you to ask it into that mic. So I think we'll, we'll go with this gentleman over here. Hold down power. So can you hear? Okay. Yes. So it sounded like uh, you know your uh, <clears throat> what you're providing is kind of cross between a credit card and a debit card because you know somehow you have to finance the the purchase, right? You know yeah. somebody's using that money, so you have to somehow you know put up yeah. that upfront. So I, I would say uh, we have nothing to do with credit card or debit card. No, I mean, we, I mean in, in terms of uh, the the functionality, yeah. in the sense that you know because they are taking an advance. Yeah. But, but to a limit, which is what debit card you know, kind of yeah. uh, provides. No, it's, it's a great question, honestly. It's a great question. But because it's a new idea, so let me, let me explain that. First thing, when we explain the solution, it's not a loan, not even an advance. Because if I'm earning, let's say I'm earning um, $100 every day, right? And I work at a place where after two weeks I get my salary. Well, if I'm in the middle of pay period, I can't access the income that I have already earned. What we have done is we have enabled employees to access their own income. So it's earned income. Yeah, I understand that. My question is to you, because you somehow have to advance the money, right? Yeah, yeah. No, so we have interaction, we have integrations with different rails. We have inter integration with ACH. We have integration with Visa. So as a result, you can bring any bank account, you can bring any card. We are able to put money on those instruments. And, and I think a sorted question there is, how do you finance that? So we, exactly, so we have partners. We have, uh, you know, money in our bank that we utilize and uh, money in our partner's bank that we utilize, and that's how we front the cash. But eventually this money comes back after the pay period ends. You know, the more you get business, the more you have to finance it. That is true, yeah. But keep in mind, the, the time period is small. It's just the pay period. You are accessing in the middle of pay period. Pay period ends. Pay day comes. We get our money back. Any other questions? Uh, Kate, pick someone. <laughs> Hi. You got it. Oh, wow, that's loud. Um, can you like lay out where you are rel in terms of like technology and just like where you are in the market versus like an Ernan, Dave, even kind of a situation like? And maybe even in philosophy, like how you approach it, like the yeah. the financial wellness as a benefit versus just straight to consumer, like, sure. you know, that type of thing. Yeah, so Ernan and Dave, they are direct to consumer solutions. So their idea is that, you know, they have nothing to do with the employer. They are just trying to make sure that if somebody is working, they can give money 
And then after that, they debit the bank account of those employees. That's how they do that. If it's, if it's just the money, that certainly you can accomplish that. But we, uh, philosophically, and also for, um, for genuine reasons, we wanted to have a model where we could engage employers. Because when employer is involved, we get much more data, much more information, that not only we can serve them by letting them access their own income, but we can also offer them other services. So in our case, let's say, in their case, for example, having a bank account is mandatory. Why? Because they have to debit the money you know, on the pay date. In our case, if employer is doing the deduction processing, we don't need to have a bank account. If somebody just opens the account and only utilizing Uber service or Amazon service, fine. You don't have a bank account, that's fine. There are so many people who are underbanked, who are unbanked, so they cannot use those services, but they could, they could use uh, pay active service. One fi time for one final question. So my question is, how are you actually making revenue? Are you charging the employer, or are you just charging less than a typical loan shark would for the same, <laughs> for the same money? I love that question. <laughs> yeah, so you know, when we started, so one option could, be, could have been that you know, become a better pay payday lender, right? So no, we didn't want to do that. So today, if you, um, I'll just put an example here. Um, if you use your debit card, uh, at a different bank than your own bank, what happens? You pay $3 to that ATM. Like if I have a Bank of America bank account and I go to Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo would charge me $3. And Bank of America would be mad, why did I go to that bank? And they would be charging me $2.95 or $2.50. So I'm being charged $5.50 at least, much more different other banks or ATMs. What we charge is, $5 for the whole pay period, you access 50% of your income, up to $500. If your pay period is weekly, you give us $3. It's a club membership, you can say, lack of a better word. You pay $3 or $5 based on the pay period type, and you have access to those, you know, those services, like an assortment of services. You can have unlimited number of rides. As I was giving this example, this lady in North Carolina utilized 23 times, so 23 transactions. We were not charging her 23 times. She, the, the, the moment she did her first transaction, first ride, she um, got the membership. She paid $5. After that, everything was free. It was like a buffet. <laughs> <laughs> And that is a beautiful place to end this, the Buffet of Financial Services. Um, thank you so much for your time Thanks here so today. Much. It was an absolute pleasure hearing from you. And you'll hear from a bunch of other really interesting folks as we leave. Me again. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to introduce our next interview. We have Tara Lookabow from our corporate innovation team and Ale Vigilante from Fidelity to dive deeper into this question of financial institutions driving innovation. Thank you. Thanks, Alec, and thank you guys for coming. Um, as Alec mentioned, my name is Tara. Uh, I am our Enterprise Innovation Director at GSV Labs which means I get to spend all of my time with Ale um, and the folks at Fidelity and all of our other corporate partners. Um, so Ale, I want to turn the mic over to you and have you introduce yourself and your background um, and your role at Fidelity. Yeah. Um, um, first of all, I'm the one between you and Joe Coughlin, so please stay. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be much, much more boring than what's happening later. Uh, my, my background, I'm, I... Basically, my first job was to work with a startup and uh, help them build a mobile internet business. Uh, five crazy guys that were coming from, uh, from Seattle, Washington, back to Italy, uh, which I loved. Uh, after that, I did corporate strategy for a few years. And uh, within corporate strategy, I realized that what I really wanted to, uh, to explore was how startups and corporates can work together. And um, uh, Fidelity gave me the, the opportunity to do this, first in London, then in Switzerland, then in the Silicon Valley, and then running the team uh, worldwide. What inspired you to take that career path, or what intrigued you about the relationship between startups and corporates? Um, 
let me say the the uh, there was a realization at some point. Uh, I used to work in the telecommunication industry, uh, corporate strategy in, uh, what was it, 2003, 2004, was a tariff plan, believe it or not. So the top of corporate strategy was basically doing statistical analysis on what happens if we give 200 minutes for this amount of money. We are, are we going to make money or not? That's, that's as far as you could go with strategy. Then suddenly 3G happens, and mobile internet, and so on and so forth, and, uh, and suddenly technology takes uh, a, much, a much more important role in the future of your company. And you realize that uh, the, uh, the technology-based innovation uh, is actually much stronger in the startup world than in the corporate. But the corporate still have the distribution, still have the scale, uh, honestly still have the money. Uh, at Vodafone, we were running a 56% 56 56 EBITDA with 16 million uh, mobile subscribers. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, if you can find the right technology, the right startup to bring in, that's a much faster path uh, to scale uh, for the startup, and it's a much faster path to market for the corporate mm -hmm. than if we were to do R&D ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking um, at these companies, either from the fidelity lens or um, you're looking for a new company to advise, are there sort of check boxes that you look for? Or um, for some of the entrepreneurs in the audience, what advice would you give them about working with large enterprises or how to make sure that they're, quote, enterprise ready before they enter these conversations? Yes, I'd say there are, um, I wouldn't call them check boxes, but uh, I'd say this. The first thing is, you need to realize which area of the corporate you're really going to affect. Uh, if you're working in a mission critical, if your technology is going to affect the mission critical part of the corporate, then uh, you need to be uh, super robust. Uh, and what I mean by that is, I'll give a silly example, but within Fidelity we move 12, 15% to the New York Stock Exchange every day. So uh, a, a mistake on the 10th decim decimal uh, is going to cost us a few millions. So that's simply not acceptable. On the other side, if your startup is working on, a, on, a, on something on the edge, something where uh, you can actually take a risk uh, without, uh, without reputational risk, uh, then it's much easier. So number one, you need to realize exactly what are you, where are you, um, where do you operate in the tech stack of a, of a corporate, and therefore what kind of maturity you need to have. Uh, the second thing I would say is listen carefully to what the corporate has to say. And um, I'll give you a silly example. The week after we launched uh, voice-based authentication, so today basically when you, call a, uh, when you call the customer care of Fidelity, uh, you're being authenticated automatically uh, by the tone of your voice. So no password, no pins, no nothing. The week after we launched uh, an amazing startup in the voice security business, basically calls me and say, oh, you guys don't get it. Uh, uh, can we please talk to the CTO, to the CIO, and so on? And I'm like, um, I understand, but you're basically telling someone who just came out of the garage with a new fancy BMW, they should have bought a Porsche. Uh, you got to wait for three years for the lease to expire and then knock back. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> knock back on the door. So, it, it, so, so listen to that because sometimes we give you advice that you might not like, but but uh, it's uh, it, it's the truth. And um, yeah, and the third thing is um, be patient. Selling to a corporate is very is very very hard. And I think the startups the startups that I've seen doing this best is the startups that understand that, and then the, the startups that can explain the venture capital, the investors, how hard that is. Can you really support a nine, 12 month sales cycle? Do you have the cash to do that? Because otherwise you are going to risk that you are investing time and money, that by the way is not yours, uh, to, um, um, to work on a, on, on, a potential, on a potential business, and you're going to get frustrated if that business doesn't go through. Mm -hmm. So some of the startups that I've seen actually start much smaller so that they can create that cash flow mm -hmm. and start going into the enterprise sales that requires that kind of different cash flow profile, profile much later. And I think they are, uh, at that point, they basically can put the right, the right weight behind a corporate sale. 
So if you really love your BMW and it's been a really reliable car, two years down the line, the Porsche calls you up and says, they've got these new features. We really want to sell you on the Porsche. How can they change your mind on the BMW? Um, <coughs> I'd say something different. Uh, I don't think that you're going to change our mind uh, between the BMW or the Porsche. Uh, until, the, until you reach a certain, a certain stage with the BMW where you actually need to change the car. But boy, you show up with a flying car and you tell me that I can, I, that I can, skip, the, that I can skip traffic on a 101, let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so something you mentioned um, previously was um, focusing on what part of the organization that you're going to add value to. Um, I think everyone here is very familiar with Fidelity Investments and the fact that your uh, service portfolio is quite broad. Um, so where are you focusing those energies or um, I guess more importantly, where, where can startups um, start thinking about where to play in the financial services space and, and how that's impactful to Fidelity? Are you thinking more of trends of what's happening in financial services? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I probably think of uh, three things that are happening, um, three big trends that uh, where where we are trying to um, where we are trying to look for the right startups. Um, the first thing is um, there's a brilliant post from uh, Greylock that talks about systems of intelligence, but um, it's, it's the first trend that I see is essentially applied AI. So AI is getting out of the technology stack and now solving real use cases. They might be small, but um, but they are going to make a difference in um, they are going to make a difference in in consumers' life. And I'm thinking for in so and I'm thinking of this as a way of taking out the cognitive load, taking away the cognitive load of of consumers, of individuals, of financial advisors, for all of those functions that are mathematical, uh, so there are math or uh, stat uh, statistics based. Uh, from the easiest thing, uh, you can, today you can automate your savings. You can apply machine learning to, under to predict your income and your expenses, and therefore every night you can basically put aside a certain amount of money that changes every day, and that, that the machine is learning is amount that you will not need in the future. You can do the same thing for tax loss harvesting. Uh, again, it's a mathematical function, portfolio reba rebalancing, a statistical function, and so on and so forth. So um, the, there are a number of these things that um, Alec was saying before. Financial services in the past were very much targeting the, the top of the market. Well, technology actually allows you to bring some of those functions that the wealthy people would hire, a financial advisor, investment advisor, tax advisor, and so on, uh, technology allows you to, to, bring the, to bring the down market. So the first one is AI for, or system of intelligence applied to um, finance functions, financial services function. Uh, the second one is um, there's, a, um, there's a nice blog from Open Invest, from Joshua Levin, the founder of Open Invest, that, um, that actually Andreessen also published, uh, that talks about the how how we went from mutual funds to ETFs and what's happening, what's happening after that. And uh, so that is, that is another area that I'm, um, that I'm really intrigued by. And what I mean by that is that the ETF were basically sold on the premises that is very hard to predict uh, a priori who is going to be the active fund manager that is going to be the market in the next 20 years. Um, so it's very hard to make a bet on an active fund that statistically you're guaranteed that will beat that that, that will beat the market. It's it's uh, better to have a machine uh, to invest um, to invest on the wider market. That those that was the premise of the ETF. However, uh, as individuals, as humans, uh, we all have convictions. We have convictions that might actually skew the market one side or the other those convictions might be uh, impact investing related. So what social impact we want to make with our investment. Or they might be about other things. Um, some of you might believe that gasoline is something that we will not use 10 years from now. Uh, 
Um, so should, should would you want to put more into platinum because platinum is uh, is a, is an element of fuel cells and fuel cell fuel cells are at the very basis of a, of an electricity based uh, economy. So I'm, I'm saying that as in I don't know exactly what is what is the, what is that future, but I think that that people will want to have a saying in there that goes beyond what the beyond what the ETFs can deliver. And uh, given the first trend, so the mathematical function being taken away from a machine, the bandwidth, the mental bandwidth that you can dedicate to that uh, as, an, a, as a human will actually um, um, will actually augment. And the third thing is that um, uh, our entire industry was built on the premises of a three stages life of a life of education, accumulation, and decumulation, or enjoyment. Uh, I think that that's not true anymore, and that, and that um, the mix of life, work, and therefore how your finances need to support that will be, uh, will be very different. How many people nowadays in their uh, late 40s uh, will probably leave a career but they have a wife, they have kids in school and so on, and they would want to build a company. What would you call that? Pre-retirement? Um, what, what is that? And financially, how are you going to support that? So I think that in that, the role of a financial advisor, the role of financial planning, all of that financial profile of your life will radically change. And with, if you think historically, um, um, Joe was talking before about the generation. Uh, I don't remember what book you were reading about the generations, the wave, age wave. Uh, so if, 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 when I think about those macro trends, I think about uh, people that have fought the, uh, the fought the World War II, basically and came back were the first people to actually accumulate some wealth. They did not inherit anything. The people that are coming after them are the people that we start inheriting something. And uh, our generation is the first generation that will have to deal with that. So as a consequence, that financial plan, again, changes completely from how my parents or how my grandparents had to think, uh, had to think about that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a long answer. That was a wonderful answer. Um, from the transition of expectations, not just on the technical side and the services side in financial services, but from the user experience side and what... Um, new generations are expecting from the technology tools that they use. Um, how has that changed how Fidelity looks at um, new product delivery um, and the startups that they bring into their portfolio? Um, so I, th I think that there is, let me say, the... Um, I'll go back to the systems of intelligence. And the way I'm thinking about that is that if you think what happened between 2000 and 2010, uh, a number of your financial transactions were suddenly available over the web. And that's what I call sort of the system of record. So suddenly you could see your credit card, your checking account, your investment account, blah, blah, blah. Um, the system of engagement is what, is what came in the next decade. So these were the likes of the mean, the personal capital, uh, the, the, the fidelity full view, and, uh, and so on. But basically, how do you aggregate the data and visualize that data? Um, and the system of intelligence that are, that are coming now are the system that will actually take action, not just give you insights, but take action. In doing that, I think that what is left is uh, the systems of value or the system of emotions. So when, when all of these functions, the data, the data aggregation, the action on top of the data are taken over by a machine, I think that humans can finally, can finally do what they do best, which is, uh, which is basically managing relationships. And so, where I, so the way I see that the interaction between financial services companies like Fidelity and customers changing is that it's a combination of the two. But a combination of the two where the human and the digital do something uh, something different. Where, for instance, you would not pick up the phone and call a customer care, or you would not walk to an investor center to ask for the balance of your account. But you would want to speak to a human 
to talk about how important it is, for instance, for the first time, in, if you are a first time immigrant, how important it is to plan for, to give your children opportunities that you did not have, and therefore, what should I do with my five to nine? What to the, should I do with my college planning? And those are questions in which I do not, once those hit your values, your personal values, I think you will want those things to, th those conversations to happen with a human. A human that is eventually helped by, uh, by technology to, um, to, for instance, surface um, latent behaviors uh, that will affect your investment strategy, that will, that will affect your risk, uh, uh, your risk propension. Mm -hmm. There is a sort of interesting um, kind of ethics and technology conversation around do we think humans can ever truly be replaced by technology in these highly regulated and, and key industries like healthcare and financial services. And you talk about how there are certain conversations that um, in human nature we would always want to have with another human. Um, do you ever see a future where humans are not the, the end for these conversations in financial services? Where I might be talking to a robot or, or a well, you, a, and you might a, not even a realize. digital AI. <laughs> I might not know. <laughs> uh, it's probably already happening. No, I think. Uh, no, I think. I, I think that the conversation between humans will have will have will have a higher value. Um, I'll give you an example of a startup that I've that I saw last week. If you are a wealthy individual and uh, your your uh, sorry your daughter is getting married and uh, you want to pull out. Hundred thousand dollars out of your uh, out of your accounts, wealthy individual, <laughs> uh, uh, and you go to your financial advisor and ask the question. What the startup does is that they would basically calculate automatically what are the trades that you should execute to most tax efficiently uh, take that liquidity out of your account. So when to answer your question, uh, you still want to have an advisor to whom you're talking about how important it is that your daughter is getting married and, and how important it is for you to actually uh, give her the, the, the wedding that she's dreaming, that, that she's dreaming of. At the same time, you don't want an advisor that is gonna spend the next three days uh, doing Excel, Excel calculations about what's the best way of extracting that. So what's the best way of selling my positions to get this kind of liquidity should be a button, should be an AI, should be a chatbot, without a doubt. But again, when you're going to touch the real, the, uh, yeah, when you're when you're going to touch things that matter to you, uh, I think that I think that that's what humans are going to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I have two last questions for you, and then I want to make sure we have some time for audience questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first is um, from your perspective. What is the largest sort of discrepancy uh, between what incumbent financial institutions say is the most important uh, innovation goal for them and what they're actually investing in? Um, let me say that the, 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 the there, isn't a, there isn't really a discrepancy. There is more of a portfolio view. And what I mean by that is that um, in a, in a, I'll give this example, but I, I, I can't make names. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a digital bank, which by the way, I'm, uh, I'm using, uh, that went down for four days uh, two weeks ago. So for four days, you could not make any transaction. You could not, uh, you could not uh, go to the ATM. None of your payments were, uh, were going out. It's OK. I'm, 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 I'm still their customer. I still use them for my day-to-day -day spending. This is something that Fidelity could never, could, 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 nev could never do. So when you think about the corporate, I think that the discrepancy is there must be a portfolio balance between keeping the lights on which is what creates the cash 
to actually invest in innovation. So there isn't a discrepancy between what we say we will invest in and what we actually uh, invest in. But clearly you need to, in, in that portfolio, there is a part of, the, there is a, a, a very big part of the investment that needs to go into keeping the lights on. Um, Makes sense. <laughs> um, my last question, um, everyone who registered and checked in at the front desk was also asked this question. So I want to make sure we ask it of you as well. Um, but essentially, is there one technology or innovative idea in financial services um, that isn't getting a lot of attention now, uh, but that you think could be industry changing over the next 10 years? Ooh. Um. <laughs> I don't know, I don't, so um, I think tokenization is something, uh, is something that might fundamentally change the industry. And when I say tokenization, I do not mean the blockchain. By the way, this is me speaking, so that, that this has nothing to do with my employer, please. Uh, but uh, so, uh, and I think that token, so, but again, tokenization not in the blockchain meaning, but in simply taking a very large asset and dividing it into chunks that can be invested in by uh, the mass market. I was talking to one of your founders before. There's a company in London that is basically um, buying commercial or uh, residential buildings, then building a special purpose vehicle uh, for every building that they buy, issuing a thousand shares for, uh, for those special purpose vehicles, and you can invest in single shares. So you can build your own portfolio or residential or commercial properties. You basically uh, cash in the rent every month, uh, and every five years you're selling the building and so on. There's no blockchain involved, but that's what I mean by tokenization. So, and you can do the same for uh, car collections, uh, wine collections, diamonds, paintings. Uh, so, uh, uh, if, if you think about that, you suddenly go from the mass market thinking about um, public equity and fix and, and bonds mm -hmm. and cash, essentially, into can I invest $100 in this startup that is pretty cool, or can I invest $100 in this 1985 uh, wine? I'm no expert. Maybe. <laughs> It was a good vintage, I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, that, that, is something, that is something that, again, would, would do exactly what Alec was describing. So bringing those, those high wealth individual, high, high level wealth individual um, uh, financial products down market uh, for the benefits of all. Awesome, thanks, Ale. Thank um, you. I've had a great time asking you questions, but I want to turn it over to the audience and see if anyone has some lingering thoughts. I think we have a couple of mic runners as well, so uh, we'll wait for the mic before you ask your questions. Hey, uh, this is Pramit. Uh, so, for me, like one of the best talks I've had like recently attended on like finance was like this one by Cliff Asnes, and uh, uh, he's from AQR. And he talks about a couple of things. And like one thing he talked about was like how multi-factor investing is completely unintuitive. It's very hard to have conviction in a multi-factor investment model. Uh, and the other thing he talked about was like how the last 10 years have been the most weird years in investing, because low volatility uh, has been there. And value investing doesn't has not been working, at least for the last two years. It's been kind of like flailing behind. So, for me, uh, a value which uh, an investment advisor brings in is the conviction, right? Like uh, the retail customer doesn't really know what's going inside uh, in invest investment instruments, uh, and the uh, investment advisor is the one who's bringing in that conviction. Now the challenge is, if AI becomes a bigger function, uh, these instruments might not even be understandable by the investment advisor. So what happens to conviction? Are we just hail, like Hail Mary and just like <laughs> things are going to work? Like what happens to uh, the belief in investment? We can't backtest things anymore. Uh, we don't know what's really happening inside these algorithms. So, whoa, that's a <laughs> that's a very interesting question. First of all, I agree with you that in a in a in an ever rising market, everybody is a genius. Every investor is a genius, no doubt. Um, but um, 
To answer, so I think there are two things in, uh, in what you said. The first one is the belief that, um, the belief that investing or making, having conviction about investment is, um, is hard, which might be true, but some individuals uh, might think differently. And what I mean by that is, if you buy the iPhone, the, if you are a guy that queues every time the new iPhone comes out, uh, you got, I don't know, many MacBook uh, at home, uh, you subscribe to Apple TV on the beta, or to Apple TV Plus on the beta, and so on, uh, I'm pretty convinced that you have conviction about Apple. Why should I stop you from, uh, from skewing your portfolio towards Apple? Now, whether that's right or wrong, this is for the investment advisor to, uh, to help you with that. Um, so that's, that's the first part of the answer. You're right. Having said that, it, I think we need, to start, we need to start having an older to older conversation as opposed to a, 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 a parent-child conversation. Uh, so that's, that's step number one. Step number two, um, I think that a lot of understanding what's behind those uh, mathematical models that the AI is bringing, absolutely, that is what, uh, what the investment advisor should do. I'll, I'll, I'll make a very, a very tangible example. We are, we are meeting a number of startups that are building those kind of black boxes that can beat the market. But the first question that they get from our, from our quant is, how can I look inside the black box? And how can, I, how can I understand exactly how did the black box come to this conclusion? And if I can't, thank you very much. I wish you all the best. And I hope you will continue beating the market. Uh, but, but this is just not something that we feel comfortable. Um, we, we feel comfortable that we could, we, we, we could bring to market. So I'm, I'm just trying to measure my words with. <laughs> I care about my badge. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more, and I think we've got uh, one hand up right here. So Kate's bringing your mic. So all of the investment in technology for financial services companies is in lieu of labor. And our traditional understanding of the pricing of products was that labor was the most substantial component of that. But what we see is these dramatic investments in um, technology, which should lower the cost. The cost isn't being passed on to the consumer. And some people are saying this is a big part of income inequality, that the component that traditionally was reserved for labor is now being reserved to management and not passed back to the consumer. Is there any discussion going on in financial services about returning that productivity to the customer set as opposed to reserving that productivity to management? I'm honestly, I, I need to be very careful with what I say here, because uh, yeah, again, I care about my badge. Um, I, can, I, 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 I can tell you this, and again, this is my own personal experience, Alessandro, not talking on behalf of my company, but um, what I can tell you is that we do feel that responsibility for the money that we manage, uh, being the retirement money of, of, uh, of, of middle class Americans. So um, we don't take that lightly. Uh, then probably our PR, our compliance department will have something, will have a proper answer to your question, but I don't, sorry. <laughs> thank you guys for your uh, questions and thank you Ale for, for joining us today. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ali. So I'm going to invite Joe Coughlin back up to the stage. He uh, spoke with us earlier. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Unlike uh, Alessandro, um, where he has to be a little reticent on some of his comments, um, every comment that I will make is exactly the way I feel and my firm feels. And I guess I could get fired by a client. but. Um, we're passionate about it. 
So can you tell us, so I think a lot of you uh, probably had the, uh, it was very exciting actually to see you speak earlier, um, but for those of them that didn't have the opportunity, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and why you're not going to get fired? Yeah. Okay. So in, in real life, uh, I uh, have a risk advisory firm, independent risk advisory firm uh, in New York, and we service what we, call, we define as the alternative capital space. That is mostly private equity funds, hedge funds, distressed debt funds, and some v VC funds that care about their investments, even though they may have a very de minimis owners ownership stake. In turn, then, we also act as outsourced risk advisors uh, to several hundred of their portfolio companies that they have in, in some capacity working with CFOs or tr treasurers or risk managers or what, what, what they may have. But we're driving transparency into the marketplace where we're not an insurance broker. We don't want to be one. We respect what they do. But we're going to drive this transparency that the clients normally don't see. So we're basically taking the carriers, which is the capacity, and bringing it closer to the clientele. Um, if anybody has seen the show Ray Donovan, I use this a lot because it's the fastest way to understand what we do. But we are fixers. Um, and I say we're like Ray Donovan without the sex and the violence. Um, except that sometimes I really would like to inject a little violence into the equation because there's so many passive aggressive individuals that you end up working with that um, they will literally work against their own company um, to, um, to stop an idea that will possibly uh, help them. So that's what we do. Awesome, thank you. So coming from New York, uh, actually we're really privileged tonight. Joe actually flew in this morning uh, to be here. Just for us, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> So Big you're fan. coming from New York. I'd love to hear your kind of take on, you know, we just had LA on the stage, some of these really large incumbent institutions. How are they reacting to all of this change? Yeah, um, well, so there's, there's so many ways to answer um, the, the, the change because everybody's just talking about disruption all the time. And if anyone was to say, what industry should be disrupted more than almost just about anything else? Uh, you would say the insurance industry. If you took, uh, this is just a fact, uh, State Farm. State Farm has a database that has 10 times the amount of information stored on it than the Library of Congress. That's just State Farm. There's 2,400 other, 2,600 other property and casualty firms that are out there that are all collecting the same amount of data. If you take that and you ex expand that out there and you say, well, what's involved in insurance and risk, risk sharing, you'd say, well, my gosh, there's got to be a better way to do it, right? You should be able to just open up your app. You should be able to download the information. You should be able to do this. Except the problem is, is that when you're buying insurance, you're buying an intangible product. And so what are you doing? You're buying, essentially, you're renting the balance sheet of a third party, which is your insurance company, for a fixed period of time, a year, three years, six years, in perpetuity if it's some kind of environmental issue. But you're renting that balance sheet. You give them a premium. They're supposed to give you a coverage when you have a claim. Well, what are you really buying? You're buying a contract. You're buying a legal contract. And what's in a contract? Words. Words have meanings. And then there's different interpretation of those meanings. We want the interpretation to be ours. So when you're sitting in a, in a very you know uh, hostile claims environment, where you know you've had a claim and now you're being denied that, that claim, you'd say, this isn't very easy to disrupt because you have, you have claims issues, you have regulatory issues, compliance issues, you have you know, data entry. I mean, it, it's, so you'd say to yourself, this, this really should be a very easy place to do it, but it's incredibly difficult. It's not just that easy to just say, oh, I can just in a flick and I can get this. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very complex. It's kind of change and disruption affecting other parts of the financial institution, thinking like risk management, um, capital investment. Yeah, well, what you can say with an absolute fact is that the insurance industry still is, but used to be more so, a, a relationship business. And an underwriter is, is sitting there looking at everybody in this room, whether they have their automobile, their homeowner's insurance, or their business, and what have you, and they have underwriting guidelines as to are you the client that we want and do you match these underwriting guidelines? Like if you have a home in a certain place, you know, how close are you to a fire department or what have you? If you're a business, 
what do you manufacture? Where do you distribute it to? What is the chances of having the claims that are going to make it back to their way, their door? Historically, it's been a relationship business that if somebody has a great relationship, if a broker has a great relationship with an underwriter, that underwriter will waive the requirements and hope that the claim doesn't make its way back and he gets caught with it. So in the past, it's been that way. Today, it's all data, right? It's data and analytics and everybody knows it exists and everybody wants to see it. And that information that's out there, uh, there's a, a friend of mine, he's no longer at, um, at AIG, but Peter Hancock, if anybody was following that, he used to be a very, very successful hedge fund manager and trader and he became the CEO of AIG. And he said, my gosh, I should be able to look at this data and it should tell me that I can't make money writing workers' compensation on all of these businesses around you know, the United States alone. So I want to get out of these places. I'm not going to do it here, I'm not going to do it here, here, or here. Or if I am, I'm going to charge this amount of money. Well, when he says, well, I'm not going to do it here, well, then he loses the business on five other lines as a result of that. So there's a systemic movement. So it's, it's very difficult. The data points to, and Peter was looking at it, that the data tells me I can't make money. So then the only other way you can do it is just collect as much as you can in premiums and then put it into some kind of very good you know, hedge fund, and, uh, which you really can't because you have statutory requirements and things of that. And I, very, it, it's very cumbersome, and that's where you get into compliance and state regulations. Okay. So we're talking about data, we're talking about yeah. patterns. Are there any patterns that you see across organizations? You work with both big and small. Yeah, um, well the, um, the, the patterns that people are going after right now um, is, is the low hanging fruit. Um, they're, they're going, there's a downward pressure for, with the amalgamation of this data to say, so what's involved in the delivery of, of risk or insurance to a client? And you'd say, well you got insurance agents the agents themselves, they get a commission. The commission's worth anywhere between 10 and 20%, depending on what kind of product line. Oh, well, we don't need to pay that. And then you'd say, well, there's, there's different types of you know, delivery systems. Some are direct writers, like Allstate and State Farm and Geico and Progressive, and others are your Chubb and your CNAs and your Travelers and your Hartfords and things like that. So you have this massive consolidation where people are saying there's, there's got to be a better way. There's just there's got to be a better way. But who owns the client and who controls the client? I think what we're seeing right now is that um, people, like with the advent of companies like Lemonade, uh, just in particular, they're, they are demonstrating the fact that, you know, I, 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 I don't care if it's just a kid or if it's, you know, a, you know, a middle-aged adult wants to buy a simple, you know, homeowner's policy or an auto policy, you can do it and you can, you know, find that you can compress those margins that once were part of the delivery system there. Okay, thank you. So I, I know we're running a little yeah. bit late, but one of the most interesting things to me whenever I talk to you is that you always seem to know what's going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when you're talking about financial services, yeah. that's hard. There's obviously yeah. a ton of moving parts. What do you do to stay up on everything? Uh, well, I, I yeah, <laughs> I wish I was, right? I, I'm, I'm, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm way behind, but it, it, I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to, to see um, that really what's going on. Well, for me, and I, I'm not just saying this because I'm here, um, this coming to, to GSV and um, is like, I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I, if I go into a hardware store, I will walk down aisle after aisle, and I went in for one thing, and I will come out with more crap. Now, I'm not saying that coming into GSV is crap. I'm saying that I don't need an Allen wrench now, right? I don't know if I'm going to need an Allen, Allen wrench before I turn 140, if anyone was listening before. But I, I want one, right? And I love seeing it, and as I go down another, another, another. So when I come out and I see all of these things that are out there, that's the way I, I try to. I, I try to keep up. I Look, I keep reading so many different things that whether we're at 25 billion or 50 billion, you know, Internet of Things, that it's, you know, connected devices by 2020 or 2022, 2025, it's coming. We do know that. And we also do know that 160 million businesses are unbanked right now, and we know that there's some 2 billion people that are unbanked. So if you're a financial institution and you're looking at this, what do you think you're thinking, 
right? Where's the opportunity? And once you get that, and kind of like Ali, once you, you've got these, these, these folks, you can have them for life. And um, it's, it's, there's big, big dollars at play here. Okay, so, so this is like a hypodermic needle for me. Just mainline injection right into my veins. Good. I'm going to put that on our website. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so you bring up a really good point. Um, can, you, do you, can you think of any examples of really large incumbent organizations that are, that are handling this well other than LA? Yeah, the two that come to mind. And no, no I won't say really, really well. I'll, I'll give like an Ali uh, comment there. Like I'll, I'll do, do a disclosure so I'm not offending anybody. I just don't think it's seen, the, the proof of day has, has the, the, the consumer has seen it yet. But um, Two Sigma is a client of ours. Uh, somebody said AQR before. That's a client of ours. Um, but Two Sigma is a, you know, it's black box trading, a very, very, very sophisticated model. And they then teamed up with Hamilton Re and AIG. You know, these companies, these insure tech companies that are out there, I, I think it was between 2012 and 2017, have grown on a CAGR, you know, compo compounded annual growth rate of 181% a year over five years. So, I mean, there's billions of dollars that are going in here, and some people are just buying up these things just to hold them, you know? It's like a put for the future. They don't even know if they're ever gonna use it. They just wanna say, okay, well, it seems good, so let's, let's spend about five, seven million dollars of this or whatever. So I, I think that those are, um, yeah, so with I that- I just even lost myself in the answer <laughs> to that question. Uh, so kind of with that, you know, do you see these large corporations getting into some of this new technology uh, predominantly through partnerships or, or through other means? Yeah. And, and the other one, thank you, it, it was AXA XL is doing some really neat stuff. And look, right now it's going with the drone technology and they're marrying some of these things. So for instance, you could have an insurance company that's down in Florida, or it could be anywhere, but it's writing policies in Florida. And if you have a swimming pool and somebody doesn't fill out the application correctly and you say that there is, um, you know, uh, a cover to it, just, you know, for mosquitoes and things like that. Well, you can now look and you can basically segment your business to if there's any, you know, covering on that pool, your loss rate is going to be far, far lower if those, those coverings are not there. So when you have the hurricanes that come in, each one of those pool coverings costs, you know, $55,000 to put back up. And if you don't have that, well, now you could sit with the drone technology. But as we said before, whether you're taking the technology that's going up there right now with OneWeb or SpaceX and Starlink system or this, you know, the, the constellation I was talking about before, you're going to see everything everywhere. So you're going to go after the vertical change that's going to affect the risk side, the transportation side, the energy. Every one of our clients is in every industry group. So they're into healthcare, they're into infrastructure, they're into the energy, the, the, the entire stream, upstream, midstream, downstream products. So everything is going to be affected by this. And, and if it's not us, it, it's, it's China. Um, but it, the, the barrier to entry is massive to get into that space. Okay, so Literally I'm, space. <laughs> I'm gonna ask one last question uh, because I, I don't wanna go over yes. time and, and I do wanna give you an opportunity to kind of network yeah. after the event. Um, you make a lot of angel investments yourself. Any in financial services? Uh, uh, one right now, and I don't want to, for anybody that, that's out there that's working on something that's going to, you know, hopefully be a part of this disruption, um, I just, I, I did it, the com complexity of it and finding it um, in a way that, that works um, and that could get adopted more than just selling your platform to a large organization right now. I'm, uh, I don't want to say I'm cynical on it, it's just that um, I, I have one but I, I have, through fund investments, I have a, a, a lot more, but I didn't do those. Those were done by a general partner. Fair enough, okay. Thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed not only this, but your talk earlier, and um, we've bribed Joe, so he's gonna be here all of happy hour, he's promised. Um, and I've got, before I let you go off stage, we had a few questions that we were really hoping, um, you know, some of the attendees from this e evening's events could answer for us. And so to get everyone to do that, we, uh, we offered a raffle, yeah, and there's, right. there's two prizes in the raffle. The first one is a year-long subscription to Passport, which I think Alec you know, told us a little bit about earlier. Um, it's a platform that supports startups, and if you're not a startup, 
Uh, there's still a ton of really valuable stuff on the platform. So if you could please draw our yeah. first winner. I am a member of Passport, by the way. <laughs> you can connect with Joe. <laughs> yes. Okay. That way. Yeah. That way. All right. Arpit from Bank of America. I know you're here. Yay. I saw you earlier. Congratulations. What's he get? Uh, he works oh, that's for the Passport. Yeah. Okay. So he's won Passport. The next uh, winner gets a really nice bottle of wine. Oh, terrific. Not quite as good as Passport, but all right. still enjoyable. I apologize to all the non-winners that will <laughs> kill me. I use my DJ voice. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Roxanne from Tigyant. Roxanne. Oh, Roxanne. Awesome. Congratulations. You thank you all so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Joe, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. Please grab a drink and network. What's with these lima beans?